Hi everybody, and welcome to Once Upon a Scarf. This channel celebrates the art of the vintage scarf, from luxury silks to bandanas. Here we take a deep dive into the wonderful stories they tell. Today, we're looking at a classic Hermes scarf from 1963 called Arabesque. As Hermes squares go, this one is fairly subdued. You could even say it's subtle. For that reason, it often gets passed over in the secondhand market, selling for well under $200. But I think that's taking a superficial view. I think there may be a hidden story behind this design. To fully appreciate this Hermes scarf, it helps to understand when it was created, by whom, and why. The last is the trickiest part to answer. But if my hunch is correct, this scarf may be a sly piece of counter-propaganda. Incredibly subtle. But then what more would we expect from the great designers at Hermes? I'm the author of two classic books on vintage fashion, Secondhand Chic and It's Vintage Jolly. I'm a huge fan of the luxury, affordability, and in this case, beautiful design traditions in great vintage scarves. I'm so happy to share what I know with you. So let's get into it. First, a quick description of this scarf. The four corners are taken up by what looks to be elaborate embroidery in knots and tendrils and blooms, design motifs that embody the scarf's name, arabesque. But this is not just about stitch work. Interspersed between the embroidery and radiating from the center are absolutely ravishing portrayals of flowers. Roses, iris, violet, pinks, daffodils, and gentian. The individual colors and shading within the flowers are a marvel. Especially the iris, where I count at least five different hues shading into each other. Technically, that's a really tough ask. Again, leave it to Hermes. Who designed this scarf? A man named Henri Dorigny, whom, if you're an Hermes lover, is someone you should know. Why? Because he was an artist and creative director at the company for 60-some years. This is the man who pioneered the Hermes tie. He designed everything from ceramics to watches. This classic Cape Cod double wrap is his inspiration. And of course, he also designed scarves, around 40 of them. Many are examples of the classic equestrian motifs your bits and spurs and stirrups and strap work in incredibly intricate knots and networks. How often and how badly these equestrian scarves have been imitated by lesser manufacturers. Dorian Yu grew up with quite an advantage. He was born into a noble class where horses and their wardrobes were everyday items. This is his grandma, as painted by the well-known Parisian artist Paul Le. As a young man, Dorigny didn't feel he could excel in a traditional career. Instead, he found himself in design at the one company that could nurture his talents and take them into the stratosphere. This gift proved to be mutual. His work was a cornerstone upon which the Hermes brand towered over the high craftsmanship world. So what is he doing in this scarf? Did the design come out of nowhere? apart from his imagination and a love for spring blooms. I don't think so. As with nearly all Hermes imagery, there's a heritage here. The clue is in the name, Arabesque. So it's Middle Eastern in inspiration, but what precisely and where? Thanks to the internet, it's possible to go deep into world design history with several clicks of a key. To me, this scarf was inspired by and pays homage to a specific craft form from the Ottoman Empire, which dominated the Middle East from 1299 to 1922. The art form was largely created by women, embroidered coverlets and wraps known as bokas. It was the fashion among the wealthy families to include bokas in their daughter's trousseaus their newly married belongings. This extravagant work found a wide range of applications in the Ottoman court, from clothing to the furnishings of the palace rooms. 
The standout element of the boca is this goldwork embroidery, known as deval in Turkish, which sees gold wire wrapped around a silk thread and then tacked down onto velvet in incredibly intricate and time-consuming swirls of the embroiderer's art. It's a little bit easier to print a replica on a silk scarf, but not much. Every line here was hand-drawn. At the center of a traditional boca, we see a radiating array of spikes. So too in the scarf, but with the brilliant added adaptation of cut flowers emanating from urns. This image too is typically Ottoman. In older times, women's grave markers were traditionally urns topped by flowers, in this case of stone. So is this scarf Ottoman in inspiration? I think so, but there's something else going on here, something very weird indeed. This scarf was produced in 1963. Sometimes with a better quality vintage squares, it's useful to take a look at what was going on in the wider world to find hints about what designers were experiencing as they did their work. What events were taking up a lot of bandwidth? Well, 1963 was a very big year for blockbuster film. In January, Lawrence of Arabia won a slew of Oscars, including Best Picture. Okay, so what? Well, the studio was pulling out the stops in terms of advertising and promotion. Here's a shot from a press package detailing tie-ins with the fashion world. Yes, this happened back then too, just like today. Vogue magazine had a special insert called The Chic of Chics. Countless department stores were doing promotions. Lines of Arabic-inspired hats were produced, all in the service of generating and benefiting from buzz about the film. If you were working in the fashion world in 1963, you simply couldn't ignore the story of the great hero, Lawrence, helping the tribes of Arabia to unite against the Ottoman Empire. I mean, maybe it's a total coincidence, but Hermes has always gone its own way. Is this scarf a gorgeous, ultra-subtle pushback against the marketing onslaught of a Hollywood studio? Or is it a nod to beautiful traditions which transcend the brutalities of territory, colonialism, and conflict? As Laura James for Vanity Fair once put it, Hermes does not boast, does not use celebrities in advertising, does not license its name, does not let imperfect work leave the atelier, does not get its head turned by trends. Was this scar? the embodiment of those principles. I think that's one for you to decide. Truly, this could be nothing more than a lovely silk scarf. No history nor opinions attached. But isn't it fun to take a closer look and discover the details that make this name its very own legend? As always, if you have any thoughts or interpretation, I'd love to hear them. And that's today's scarf story. I hope you enjoyed it. Please press the usual buttons if you'd like to see more.